Hello, everybody. No, the last name is difficult, so it's Raja Gopal. <laughs> Nanda Raja Gopal from Foundry Networks. Hopefully, you've heard of Foundry. If you have, if you have, if you have not, do come over to the Beer and Gear event. If not, if you already heard of it, that's fine too. Please uh, come over to what we often say is one of the you know, best networking events during Nanog, the Beer and Gear part. So, my topic for today is multi provider Ethernet service delivery. And uh, in the course of talking to several providers and also several businesses of contemplating um, purchasing Ethernet service delivery, this seemed to be a kind of a topic which caught the interest of uh, many folks, which is the reason why I'm talking about it today. So, first of all, in terms of um, what I plan to cover, hopefully, this will take about 20, 25 minutes maybe, and uh, since we are ahead of schedule, we'll have some good time for Q&A towards the end. So what I plan to cover is um, what exactly is multi-provider Ethernet service delivery. Um, the typical way in which it's done today, a proposed model, also comparison with other potential approaches, benefits, challenges, and then open it up for uh, interactive discussion towards the end. <clears throat> it's always a good question to ask before talking, uh, talking about any problem if there's really a need for it. So the major drivers for large-scale Ethernet service um, deployment across multi-provider networks, which is really what Ethernet, multi-provider Ethernet service delivery is, there are really many drivers for it today. But first and foremost being the increasing globalization of customers who purchase such services. Um, number two being the fact that the reality is that there's a limited reach of providers and the lots of local providers that are more common than what I would say is global titans. There's clearly a need to simplify inter-provider handoffs and um, oftentimes business continuity reasons might require enterprises to connect critical sites to a second provider. Another thing which is important, I guess, in the wake of the Dow hitting a new record last week is the fact that integration of networks after acquisition is also something um, wherein multi-provider Ethernet service delivery comes to play. So I like to think of us, ourselves as being in the Dow 12,000 era at the risk of sounding like an irrational, you know, of, of, at the risk of sounding as somebody suffering from irrational exuberance. Um, and last but not the least, multi-provider Ethernet service, multi-provider service delivery is or was common in the frame delay and ATM deployment days. And so having a similar expectation from Ethernet service delivery is, uh, is something that we can expect customers to have. So reset to what is done today. So predominantly, it's a point-to-point -point service. In the terminology of Metro Ethernet Forum, it's an e-line service. And multi-point services, or ELAN service, as MEF likes to call it, are mainly delivered as transparent LAN services. But we're all aware about the limitations in terms of scalability there, the complexity in management, and it's fair to say that VPLS is now um, beginning to pick up in terms of offering this service delivery. But that said, it's a fast-growing market, even though it's small today compared to the alternatives. And the majority of the services continue to be um, leased line, frame relay, or ATM. Perhaps the, the two big challenges continue to be the geographic coverage that continues to be the big hindrance in terms of increasing adoption to the Ethernet service. And if you were to break it down into why this is such a big problem, I would call it as one, reach of fiber, and B, reach of the provider. And this presentation talks specifically more in terms of addressing the reach of the provider issues and how we as a community can cooperate uh, to have uh, inter-provider or multi-provider Ethernet services. So the proposed model here is, is fairly simple. Assume that you've got two provider networks and there's, there's no um, kind of imposement in terms of how Ethernet service delivery is done within that network. The idea is to use a simplified external NNI 
or a network network interface between the provider boundaries. And the model proposes using the recently standardized IEEE 82.1AD. So essentially what you have here is a case wherein you've got, for example, customer A, which got some sites wherein that could easily be connected to provider one's network, and maybe it's got some sites um, which cannot be addressed directly by provider one, but can be addressed by provider two. So provider one and two need to kind of maybe have an agreement so that they could help deliver an Ethernet service, either point-to-point -point or point-to-multipoint, between um, all the sites that connect uh, customer A. Uh, in this example, we are, the, the diagram talks about using VPLS within the provider one network. There really isn't any, um, you know, imposement in this model as to what the technology should be used within a provider's network. So the model in words, um, each provider is responsible for his or her own network and for what I call a simple handoffs to the adjacent provider's network. And as mentioned before, each provider independently chooses the appropriate technology to transport Ethernet service over that domain. So you could be using VPLS, you could be using just Ethernet over MPLS, we're just using point-to-point -point VPNs. Um, if for some reason there is uh, a resistance to move to MPLS-based networks and you're fine with having a, a pure layer two network using .1AH or the emerging .1AH, that's fine too. Or if somebody wants to use L2TP v3 within a provider's network and have Ethernet over L2TP, that's, that's perfectly fine too. But the goal here is that the handoffs to the other providers are done using A22.1AD as the ENNI. In a minute, I'll, I'll come to um, a quick overview of .1AD and how it applies to this model. Um, the dot one eighty also has provisions for handling the service VID translation, which is useful in terms of um, interfacing with another provider's network. And secondly, you could also be using the combination of SVID and CVID and map it to the partner's E-line or um, ELAN segment, which is it's also possible. The boundary nodes are the ones which really sit at the border of your network or you as a provider's network and which also talks to the, uh, to, to, to the partner network. And, it, it, and the role that it plays is essentially incoming packets which come from the neighboring provider's network because they're coming in dot .1AD form that be mapped to the appropriate tunnel in the provider domain. Okay, so for instance, if you're using VPLS, you're mapping dot one AD into the VPLS instance. Um, if you're using dot one AH, then maybe you'd be mapping the dot one AD frames to dot one AH. Conversely, for packets going out to the neighboring provider network, you'd be terminating the local tunnel and then encapsulating the packet in dot one AD and sending it to the neighboring provider. So in terms of the dot .180 frame format, um, at, at, you know, from, from just looking at it, it kind of appears as if it's really very similar to Q and Q, but really it's, although there are encapsulation related um, similarities, you know, dot .180 is fundamentally quite different from that. Um, but some of the things which are useful from the point of view of the NNI is that there is a discard eligible indicator which is there in the outer or the service tag or the service VLAN ID and um, the, the C VLAN ID or the C tag format is uh, fairly similar to the, the VLAN encapsulation as we know today. And what used to be known as 822.1P is encoded as the priority code point or PCP. So in terms of traffic engineering and QoS, um, again, the approach is to take a hierarchical view of this. So each provider network determines the best path within that network. Uh, 
and it's optimized within each domain. What's key here is that the inter-provider boundaries, we've got the mappings between EXP to dot one AD PCP mappings. Again, assuming here that you know the, the first provider uses uh, MPLS within that network. You can you, you're really doing this at at the service instance level because the inner tag, or so to say, as the the customer frames are itself being transported transparently without the modification of that. Resiliency is often a big concern or redundancy. And the resiliency mechanisms which are used by each provider within um, his domain of influence or within his network is independent of what other providers may be using. So again, going back to the example of using VPLS, for instance, within a provider's network, you could be using fast readout within that network. And the mechanisms that are being used for redundancy in your partner's network have got no bearing on this. However, at the boundary nodes, you could be using dual homing um, for the provider-provider interconnect for inter-provider resiliency. In terms of provisioning, what a provider needs to know is the SVID of the partner provider or something that they could agree upon and then submit a request to the partner provider where the partner provider's operation staff would map that SVID, CVID instance to the L2 VPN instance that's internal to their network. Now obviously this kind of becomes a little cumbersome if you're handling a lot of uh, instances, so wholesaling often becomes a more appealing uh, alternative. In this case, you do not care about what's a CVID that's being transported, but the SVID really acts as a tunnel that is transported across the provider beast network. If I were to draw a corollary with um, ATM networks, I would say that this is kind of like ATM VP trunking here. So in this case, um, the SVLAN bridge functionality of 822.1 AD, wherein you really do not have a CVLAN component and you're just kind of mapping an SVID instance to another, um, um, when you're really operating at the S VLAN ID instance level is, is all that is required. And this may well be simpler to manage um, based on the traffic patterns that are flowing within the network. And of course, existing provisioning systems used by the provider can continue to be used. As far as troubleshooting is concerned, um, logically troubleshooting a report, reported incident within a provider domain first would be the right thing to do. So the question here is, can I reach the endpoint of this service instance within my provider domain? Um, if yes, then clearly it's, it's something that we have to work with the partner provider. If not, it's something you'd be troubleshooting internally. But within the domain, OEM utilities such as LSP ping or dot one AG, et cetera, can be used to troubleshoot the L2 VPN instance. Something that's more difficult, however, is troubleshooting SLA violations for the end-to-end -end, you know, customer service because this clearly requires cooperation among the providers. And examples of such um, violations could be maybe a certain round-trip delay got exceeded or perhaps there's a simple connectivity loss or a much more simpler issue of a connectivity loss for an end-to-end -end service. In terms of comparison with other approaches, um, I picked two examples here, one being HVPLS and the second being multi-segment pseudo-wire. So if you look at HVPLS with spoke VLL, it expects the different provider networks through which the EVC is delivered all support VPLS, at least, if not full VPLS, at least the spoke part of it. Um, Multi-segment pseudo-virus is clearly something which has been gathering a little more momentum of late at the ITF, but it's fair to say it's still the conceptual stage with little vendor support today. But that said, it's really suitable for very large-scale deployments and also, more interestingly, facilitates interworking of different pseudo-wire types. <clears throat> 
Uh, in fact, what's really proposed here in this model can be looked at as a subset of um, multi-segment pseudo-wire that's, um, that's, that's in the works right now, which goes with the descriptive and short name of inter-provider switching using attachment circuits. In terms of the benefits of this approach, A, it's a hierarchical solution to offering multi-provider services with the hierarchy most importantly being aligned across organizational boundaries. It uses the technologies that are already standardized today or well known. So dot 180 was ratified earlier this year, as I mentioned. So this helps avoid vendor lock-in and for providers who are contemplating to provide such multi-provider service delivery, um, gives a range of options to, to choose from. One thing that I find appealing here is that the technology used in provider A's network is independent of what is used in provider B's network, with the exception that the boundary nodes, of course, should be supporting dot 180. <laughs> to be sure, there are quite a few challenges, which are probably more at the operational level um, as opposed to the technology level. First of all is the inter-provider relationships. And by the way, some of these are kind of general challenges, I would guess, in terms of um, inter-provider service delivery. The first one is, of course, who owns the customer? Um, this is the, it's the customer owned by the provider with whom contact was first made? Or maybe you have a policy wherein there is ownership based on geographical regions. So I'm a provider based on the West Coast, and maybe I want to have um, an agreement with somebody who serves the UK area, and because I've got no interest in having local service in the UK area. Maybe anybody who um, is a customer in the UK area becomes my partner's customers, and anybody else would, in, in my local area would be my customers. You could also have revenue sharing arrangements based on any such criteria. Of course, I'd welcome other thoughts in terms of um, revenue sharing agreements that, that we could have. The other one is in terms of the customer or the end user ownership related to provisioning. So a logical next step would be, even though it's a pretty significant leap forward, would be to have the provisioning systems of providers be integrated to simplify end-to-end -end provisioning. And I guess this really is driven by the number of instances of you know, Ethernet services when you'd be having multi-provider segments. Billing account and accounting, and as we saw before, SLA guarantees maintaining that is certainly not trivial. Um, so while, while negotiating a, a partner agreement here, I think it's, impos it's important that the two providers agree on what is the SLA that we could agree upon, at least for the tunnel. Ditto for troubleshooting and end customer outage. Um, the, the, the customer who's purchasing the Ethernet service needs to know who should take responsibility for the resolution. And a simple answer to this would be the provider who sends the bill to the customer, he takes responsibility for, for this. So that's pretty much what I had. And before we open it up for Q&A, I'd just like to take a small poll. How many of you are contemplating or actually already doing multi-provider Ethernet services today? Thank you. So that's it that I had, and uh, feel free to come over to the microphone and, and have some questions. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> Keith Mitchell, ISC. Um, I've done quite a lot of this um, layer two into provider provisioning in the past, and there's a whole bunch of issues. Um, I think one of the biggest ones is um, that layer two infrastructure is much more fragile than, than layer three IP, and it's very easy for um, stray layer two traffic, particularly if it's non-unicast traffic um, in one provider's network to cause um, operational issues in another provider's across the interconnect. I'd be interested to know if this approach you're proposing has any mechanisms to help prevent and deal with these kind of issues. 
Okay, so so first of all, just to make just to make it um, more explicit, what's being proposed here is not to have a layer two infrastructure, but the focus is on providing layer two service, which means that could be built on top of a layer three infrastructure. So, for instance, you know, when we talked about um, MPLS layer two VPNs being used, it's really being built over a layer three infrastructure. So it's it's the handoffs where you're really having a layer two handoff. Does that, does that help? Okay, but there's still a layer two service being provided end to end and there's still the possibility of interconnection of different layer two infrastructures um, and layer two traffic causing problems. Right, so that's really something the customer decides, or the end customer decides to purchase as a layer two service, right? Okay. So, <clears throat> question for you first, and then I'd like to poll the audience. Um, do you think providers are going to have any concern about um, broadcast flooding and unknown unicast going across the wide area? Uh, right, so I guess it goes back to you know, the question the previous gentleman asked. Absolutely, and I think um, while planning for a network like this, we've got to have you know, checks in place to make sure that that does not happen. And, and I think it's fair to say that most equipment in the market today already have those mechanisms in place. I, I just want to reemphasize again that the goal here is not to have a layer two infrastructure, but only to have a layer two service that's being uh, delivered end to end. Uh, but all the current proposals don't address this issue very well. So are, are you proposing that something needs to be fixed or brought to the standards community to deal with this? Right, so I think there are um, already efforts underway, for instance, at the IEEE and ITF in terms of uh, curtailing broadcast storms um, because it's kind of so much futuristic, I think it, it's hard to talk about that right now mm -hmm. without really um, you know, getting into something which is, I, I would say, about at least a couple of years from commercial deployment right now. And you said that the hierarchy will allow a scalable service. Um, have you um, received or tried to get any data on the number of Macs that could be supported over this? or? Do you suggest a, a, a safe deployment as the front end the service with routers? Right, so I think if you're talking about um, point to point deployments, then there's really no need for doing MAC address learning. The issue comes more in the point of uh, point to multi point services, right? Um, so, um, yes, there are certainly you know, limits there that one should be cognizant about. and. Um, uh, the only thing I would say that is that it's an important consideration while planning out your network in terms of designing uh, the, the equipment that needs to be chosen as well as the way the network is laid out. Okay. I'd like to hear what the audience says if anybody's an opinion. Sure. Hi. Just a correction on the multi-segment pseudo-wire. And in fact, we implement towards the end of last year, interrupt with the two vendors and in deployment right now. And also that is beyond concept in ITF. As a matter of fact, we address interdomain OAM and a bunch of other stuff already. So whatever you consider as other solutions already working, it's already in deployment. Thank you. Okay. So to just back up the conceptual, I meant, um, you know, it, it's still at a draft stage, but thank you for the correction. Other comments or questions? Thank you. Thank you.